It would be different if they took him from the wild, but he was hatched in captivity. Morally, the only thing that Morley knows is being around people. When Morley is outside, like I just got done with the center over at Lake Placid Lodge, and when we're outside, when the pigeons flew over, he looked really nervous because he's, he feels more exposed out in the wild. Even though in the wild, that's his natural habitat if he were hatched in the wild. So they, somebody let Clacker go, and there was this big huge thing, they were showing videos and everything. They tried to catch him for a while. Um, he started, and Clack was like 13 years old when Morley's only eight. Clacko started hunting on his own, and he's in Central Park, so they said, okay, we're going to get home for now. The problem is, people poison rats down in Central Park. So there's going to be a point, if any of you follow, did any of you hear Pal Mal, the red tail that nested in New York City? He lost three mates and several of his chicks to do poison rats. So we're hoping, we're hoping that that doesn't happen. Which brings up the question, how old can Morley live? He's going to be eight this year, but how old can he live to? Anybody want to take a shot? Young lady from Texas? 25. 25, what do you think? She right? You want to go higher or lower? I'm like money Hall. Higher or lower? 35. 35? Okay, we got 35, we got 25. Anybody feel higher than that? <laughs> I know. Okay, well, I'm going to take your 25. I'm going to take your 35. I'm going to add them together, and I'm going to tack on another five. Morley can live to be 65 in captivity. Wow. 65. He's turning eight this year. Yeah, I know. I said that. People looked at Morley, then they looked at me. I get that. I'm turning 64 in a couple months. Am I going to make it to 120-something? Yeah. Probably not. But the nice thing is I teach a course or two at Paul Smith's College on Birds of Prey. I work with all kinds of young adults. And I, as I, as I like to call them, I have the godparents to the owls. So when Morley was a baby, I had a young lady spend lots and lots and lots of quality time bonding, bonding, bonding with him. And her and her husband live about 40 minutes away, so she comes up a few times a year just to reacquaint. So not only do I have somebody I can trust when I'm gone, but more importantly, somebody Morley can trust. And check this out. Morley's a big kid to Look at Bobby. Morley thinks he's a pop. When Morley was a year and a half old, Morley got loose on me up at Lake Placid Lodge. He's 100% free, the sun is setting. And I'm thinking, oh man, the worst thing that possibly could have happened just happened. I chased Morley around Saturday night, all day Sunday, all day Monday. I didn't sleep for about three days. Finally, Tuesday, and Morley kept doubling back. The furthest he went away was only a quarter of a mile, because I'm Papa to him. And every night, you know how I found him every night? I would go out and say, Morley, and Morley would go, Ooh, and he led me to him every night. And finally on day three, Tuesday morning, he finally got hungry, and he flew down to me. No little rat. <laughs> and you notice I let him nibble me? When he nibbles me, I will show affection by nibbling. Um, I always tell kids it's kind of like a doggy kiss when they lick you. It's like an owl kiss. When he nibbles me, it's our way of showing affection to one another. It's our way of reinforcing our bond together. And moms, I'm, I'm looking at you with the three little ones. You know this, mom. If your child, if you're in an area where there's a lot of hustle and bustle and your little ones get nervous, you put a hand on their shoulder and it kind of reassures them, right? Morley does the same thing with me. If Morley's getting nervous, his feathers are puffing up, he's getting a little nervous. I let him nibble my finger, his feathers go right down. He's like, Papa's here. Now, people ask, where Eurasian owls are found all throughout Europe, all throughout Asia. Their populations, <coughs> for a while, they were, they, they were no, there were no evil owls in Europe, in um, uh, British Isles. They have come back to the British Isles, they're starting to pop up. 
their population is starting to grow again. Because for a while they, you know, they were persecuted. Anytime they saw a bird of prey, they would shoot it. Thankfully, they're starting to stop doing that. Um, they still do it in some places, but thankfully the population is starting to rebound. Now, in the bird of prey world, where's my bird of prey expert? Who's bigger, the males or the females? I don't know. I don't really know. All right, Texas here says female. You shouldn't have told. You shouldn't have told me you're from Texas, sister. <laughs> By the way, you two need to talk. <laughs> she was born in Texas. <laughs> All right, in the bird of prey world, the girls are bigger. I've always said birds of prey have listened to Beyonce. The females are bigger, tougher, much more spirally. His younger sister is not much taller, wow. and she's double the girl. Wow. She is huge. She's huge. The reason why they're bigger, there's a phenomenon that's called reverse sexual dimorphism. And out of the 500 plus species of raptors throughout the world, other than the ones that he carry in the vultures, there's only four owls, three found in Australia, one found in the States where the male is bigger. The rest, the females are bigger. Why do you think the females would be bigger than the males? Mm. Anybody have a thought? Maybe, be, maybe for hunt, maybe for like hunting, and because they're raising the young or something like that. Okay. For hunting. All right. Well, when maybe. they're nesting, the male does the lion's share of the hunting. Okay. What's the female doing then? Nesting. The the raising the babies and keeping them warm. And nest defense. Yeah. She's doing the lion's share of the nest. So the female wants to be a force to be reckoned with when the male is hunting. And the male has got to be smaller because he wants to be quicker, he wants to be agile, he wants to be able to turn on a dime. The bigger he is, the more energy he's spending, the harder it is to turn. So the males are smaller, the females are larger. Mm. <coughs> but then... The females have to protect the chicks from the male. The male is not wired to hunt. So the females got to be big enough to, at least for the first day or two. Once the male figures out, hey, these are my chicks, it takes them a little while to catch on. But once he figures it out, then she doesn't have to stop them. But until then, she's got to be much bigger. Yeah. Now, think about this. You see, Molly standing on one foot. Do you think he hurt his foot? What do you think? Do you think he hurt his foot? Sam was standing on one foot. No, you don't think he did? <laughs> when we sleep, humans, we like to lie down. Birds don't lie down, they're standing. Molly's on his feet. Most of his life, he's standing on his feet. If I stood on my feet for eight years straight, my legs would get tired. So what he's doing is he's resting this leg. Then he rests this leg. So occasionally he'll stand on one foot to rest. Now, Morley does lie down, but he doesn't do it a lot. Now, picture this. People always ask, how much does he weigh? What do you think? How much is not much? 10 pounds. 10. 12 pounds. Whatever, 7, 10, 12? 12 pounds. 12? Okay. Okay. Uh, five? Okay, so five through seven, anybody have any other number than that? Maybe twenty. Uh, Fifty? What do I hear over there? Twenty maybe? Uh, 20. Okay, so we got five to twenty. You know, I gotta tell ya, yesterday I was at an elementary school and I got two hundred <laughs> five thousand eight hundred million infinity. Um, more than five. More than five. Hmm. And people are like, wait a minute. That big he weighs five? All right, Morley, I'm going to say the P word. Morley hates the P word. Morley, I'm just saying the P word. I'm not doing it. If, if Morley, if I were to plug him, two thirds of what you're seeing there are feathers. Two thirds. And he's covered with 10,000 feathers. Somebody actually took the time to figure out how many feathers are birds. Um, 10,000. Um, thousand feathers. A smaller bird, they still have 10,000, they're just smaller feathers. Um, so, picture this. It's kind of like us, in wintertime, walking around with that big, stuffy winter coat. 
It makes you look huge like an Oompa Loompa, <laughs> but you're really not that big once you take the coat off. That's kind of rude. Now, <clears throat> I could get Morley to do this sometimes. She's learned to ignore me, but maybe we'll see. Okay, people wonder how far Morley can turn his head. <gasps> hey, you, mister, what's your name? Titus. Titus? Cool name, Titus. Sit straight up for me, would you please, Titus? You don't have to stand up. I don't want you to fall, but just sit. You can just sit. There you go. Now turn your head as far as you can in one direction without moving your body. All right, without moving your body, right there. Turn it that way. Now turn the other way. Now turn the other way. Okay, good job, Titus. Titus can do a half a circle. That was really good, Titus. <laughs> Titus can do a half a circle. Morally, if I'm Morley's head, I'm going to move as far as Morley can turn. So here, I'm, I'm start like this. I got to where Titus was. Then Morley can go to here. He can do a full circle. But then, Morley can do a circle and a half. By the time he's huh. done, I'm looking for an exorcist. <laughs> my word is possessed. What the heck is going on? A circle and a half. How is that possible? What do you think is Morley? Bobblehead owl? They got rubber bands in there? What gives an owl the ability to turn so far? Anybody want to come up with a theory, a hypothesis? Mm, some kind of ball and socket? I don't know. <laughs> Definitely something with the spine, for sure. And keep going with that. What do you think? Different bones? Maybe cartilage? What are you thinking? Okay, so you're thinking more bones. Okay, that makes sense. Anyone else have a theory? How can an owl turn its head so far? It's not connected. The bones aren't connected? <coughs> so maybe there it's a loose flowing kind of joint. That makes sense. Titus, if you have an idea, that's how you wave it at me. You think it's got rubber bands in there? Yeah. How is the owl turn Yeah, we're figuring it out right now. How about you ladies over here? I see you over there. <laughs> how how can an owl turn its head so far? I'm an old science teacher. I love class participation. I and I always zone in on the people in the back of the class. Oh, the yeah. <laughs> I have you pegged. Yeah, I'm watching you two in the back over here too. Right. So think about this. The reason why Morley can turn his head so far, you and I in our neck, we have seven cervical vertebrae. Morley's got 14. He's got double the number. Oh. If you got double the number of bones, you got double the number of joints, so you can turn twice as far. And then owls are supposed to have ten times more muscles in the neck so they can twist it further. And then the other thing that keeps them alive while they're doing this is with us, if you look at the, the channels in your, in, your, in your bones, the blood vessels fit in those channels perfectly. They fit like, the exact same size just slightly smaller. With owls, the channel is 10 times bigger than the blood vessel. So when they turn, basically the blood vessel pinches, it forms like a water balloon of oxygenated blood. So that they're not snipping their blood vessels and they actually have oxygenated blood so their brain's not dying. So here's my question. <laughs> Look at her, she's like, this is why I sat the back. My question is this. And all of you adults, I'm going to get a bunch of you to start thinking. There is a bird, other than an owl, that can turn its head 360. You, ladies, really? you can talk to each other. You can conference. Take, take a couple seconds if you can think about there's a bird other than an owl. And because I'm an old science teacher, I love asking questions. All right, everybody good? If you give me an answer, nobody else can use that one. Ladies, go ahead, give me a, give me a bird. Wait, which one are you going with? No. Uh, Peregrine Falcon. Guys, come over here. Oh, eagle. Uh, eagle. Now, there are all kinds of eagles. Are you going to just take all the eagles? I'm taking them all. Okay, okay. <laughs> How about you three right here? Penguin? I don't Penguin? Penguin, okay. How about you, sir? 
I don't know. Um, <laughs> Okay, falcon of some type? Okay, she's got the An eagle? Pigeon? What a woodpecker. Woodpecker? I got nothing. Oh, come on, give me something. I'm going to give you a hint. See? Okay, chicken. No. How about here? You too? Chicken? Hawk? Oh, how about the back? Vulture? Okay, ready? Ready? I was going to my hand. Think, think. Flamingo. Yeah. Uh, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Because I gave you the hint when I told you I was an old science teacher. Contrary to popular belief, teachers like to see their students succeed, not fail. All birds can turn their head 360. Really? You guys were right. Look at you. Oh, they are like, yeah. <laughs> all birds can. Because all birds have 14 bones in their neck. You've huh. seen it. You've seen pigeons do it. You've seen chickens do it. But we keep people keep telling you owl, 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 so it doesn't register. And let's face it, when an owl turns its head like that, owls make it look cool. Yeah, yeah. Now, think about this. Hey, Titus, Morley's always talking to me. When I wake up in the morning, I let my dog out. Morley hears me and he goes like this. He goes, Guess what he's telling me? What do you tell people when you see him in the morning? He's saying, hello, how are you? Where have you been? When I walk into his room, he goes, Wah! Now guess what he's saying to me? He flies to me. What do you think he's telling me? When you wake up in the morning, what do you want? Food. He wants breakfast. He's saying, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. <laughs> After he's done eating breakfast, he leans up against me and he goes, wah, 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 and he nibbles on my show on my arm, he nibbles on my face. Guess what he's telling me now? Hello. What do you tell somebody when they give you something? Thank you. <laughs> he's saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, because I'm Papa. He goes, thank you, I love you. I used to try and do the heart. Mm -hmm. I know he looks like a potato. <laughs> um, and then, and then he, uh, he does the, um, if one of you walks up to him too quick, he'll lean back and he'll go, <sighs> because it would be like me doing this to Titus. If I got like this and I'm talking to her like this, it's kind of scary, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You're like, what is that creepy old guy got his face in my face for? Get out of here. <laughs> Morley does the same thing. He's like, why is this person so close? And if he gets a little nervous when I pick him up, he makes a little nervous. <laughs> so he's always talking to me and letting me know what he feels. But he also has nonverbal signs that he tells me how he feels. And by the way, you're looking at him right now. What's the big thing that stands out on Morley that you notice right away? The ears? All right, his eyes or the ears, right? <laughs> the ears, they're actually feathers. But they got an important job. Now, back in the day, they used to say that the feathers would help break up the owl's silhouette. But I don't know if I buy that. I was driving down the road one time, the sun had just set, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a silhouette with ear tufts. And it didn't confuse me immediately. I knew what it was. It was a great horned owl. <coughs> but what, what the ear tufts do it's like an owl mood ring. You can tell what he's feeling by the position of his ear tufts. Hey, do you have a dog? What's your dog's name? Say it again. Dog Kaylee. Dog Kaylee. Dog Kaylee. Do dog Kaylee? Yeah, but we have, she has a sister named Kaylee too, so we have human Kaylee. Oh, I used to have a dog named Jake and I had a nephew named Jake. There was Jake the boy, Jake the dog. Okay. All right, got it. Now. Kaylee the dog probably loves you, doesn't Kaylee? Can you, when the dog, when Kaylee's tail is wagging, what's that tell you? Happy or sad? Happy. happy. If the tail's drooping, what's that tell you? Happy or sad? Yeah. yeah. So you can tell what a dog is feeling by looking at the tail and body language. I can tell what Morley's feeling by the position of his ear tufts. If his ear tufts are all the way forward, if 
The old saying, don't mess with the bull, you get the horns, it means he's angry. Or he's super amorous. Um, if his ear tufts are lying completely flat on his head, he's nervous, he's afraid, he's scared. Or maybe he's just quizzical. What is that over there? If his ear tufts are standing up like that, that's more or less Morley's happy look. That's him. I got to go for a ride today. Morley goes for a ride. He rides on this perch in the back seat of my car. From my house to here is an hour. The whole way is looking out the window. He loves going for a ride. Um, I get the craziest looks going down the highway, but he likes going for a ride. Um, <laughs> and he gets to meet all these new and interesting people. He gets a new change of venue. So that's He's, that's his happy look. Now, this over here is Winnie, and you notice Winnie doesn't have ear tufts. Oh. Barn owls don't have ear tufts, but the way you can tell with Winnie is you still watch her body language. Is she's nervous, she acts very jittery. She acts very nervous. She's moving around, she acts scared. Right now, she's fairly comfortable. If I were to walk up to her, you see she's watching me, if she feels like I'm, I'm going to ask her to do something she doesn't want to do, see, she's tense enough for this thing. Yeah. So, um, where Morley was hatched in captivity, Winnie, <coughs> Winnie is a rescue bird. Um, she came from Tucker Lake over two years ago. She got hit by a car. I've had her for two years. She will be turning five years old this year. So that brings up the question. If she's turning five, and I've only had her for two years, she was hatched in the wild, how do I know she's turning five? How do you age an owl? Do you count the number of mice on, a birth uh, mice on the birthday cake? <laughs> Anybody have an idea how to age an owl? All right, what about the feathers? Go ahead and hear first. Go ahead. Um, the color? All right, the color. Titus, what were you going to say? I'm dying of curiosity. As a boy, a dog named Rennie. A dog named Rennie. All right, ladies, I'm going to bug you one, one last time. I know, I know, you came for a good time, and this old guy's harassing you. How do you age an owl? You know? Age, how do you figure out his age? Okay, the beak. Well, the beak is the same material that makes it your fingernail, so it can get longer, wear down, depending on the situation. But that's a good idea. And I heard feathers over here. Anybody else over on the bar? Anybody else want to give me a shot? <laughs> okay, let's do the easy one first. Everybody knows this. How do you age a tree? Oh, rings. Rings. Count the rings, right? Yeah, you got one? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, it's not like you. That's a good idea, but you're thinking humans where we lose our hair as we get older and that's what we're noticing. Um, um, birds, birds, birds generally always have the same number of feathers all the time, but that is a good thought. That is a good thought. Um, here's the deal. You count, you age a tree by counting the rings. You know you can age a tree without killing it, right? You can take a tree borer and you, it's like a hollow drill. And when you pull it out, you can count the rings and just make a tiny hole about the size of my finger and you can plug the hole. So the tree's still alive and now you know how old it is. How do you age a bear? I used to do this. With the teeth, what part of the teeth? Like, are you looking at the wear of the teeth? No. You have to cut it. Ooh, look at you. Step it up, step it out. I like it. With deer, you age them by looking at the wear of the teeth. But with bear, they have all these big monstrous teeth, but they have two tiny little small premolars. You, first of all, you tranquilize the bear. The bear does not like <laughs> you doing this. Then you pull one of those teeth, thus the tranquilizing the bear. You take that tooth, you soak it in an acid to break down the enamel, you soak it in a stain, you cut thin sections, you count the rings. Just like the tree. You knew that, right? Oh. Yeah. Biologist? No. If, if you 
hunt bears, you have to send in part of the bear for yeah. the biologists. Cool. And cool. So anyway. Thought you were going to say, no, I'm a tooth guy. <laughs> no. <laughs> so you count, you, count the, you count the rings, just like a... So how do you age an owl? And don't tell me you're going to cut my owl in half and count the rings. <laughs> it definitely has to do with the feathers. Right. And young lady over there, you were right. It had to do with feathers. Okay. Yeah? It's not the amount, that's what she said, and that's both whole ideas. It makes sense, it makes sense. People think that, and it does make sense. You like a roll of things? Yeah. Okay. Here's what happens with owls. Owls produce in their blood, and I'm getting to the feather parts, so bear with me, a plasma protein called porphyrins. When they first start making their feathers, they have blood quills, so the blood gets in the feathers. Well, if I take a UV light and shine it on an owl's wings, the new feathers, if I shine a UV light on it, the new feathers glow raspberry red. A super bright, bright, like fire engine red. It pops red. Over time, direct sunlight breaks the porphyrin down. So the, pat, so the feathers fade. So you can age them by looking at the pattern of new versus old feathers um, to figure out how. So when I got Winnie, the very first year we aged her, and we said, all right, she's two years old, going on three. Well, I've had her for two years. She's going on five now. Now, what's cool with Winnie, Winnie could be a male, she could be a female. Remember, we said the way you tell the difference, generally between males and females in practice, the females are larger. Winnie's kind of a tweener. She's a small female, she's a large male. She's somewhat in between. And there is a lot of overlap between males and females with birds of prey. <clears throat> the reason why I decided to call her Winnie is I have a friend of mine who was a rehabilitator who was taking care of her at the time. And I said to her, I said, I'm either going to call her Winnie or Winston. And she goes, oh, my mother's name is Winnie. So I thought, all right, we're going to honor her by calling her Winnie. Yeah. And my students call her Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> <laughs> now you notice that these eyes are black. More of these eyes are orange. There's a reason for that. And if you look at a snowy owl, their eyes are lemon yellow. What does eye color have to do with owls? White. Hunting. <coughs> okay, hunting light. Okay, here's the deal. And it, this isn't 100%, it's more like 85%, but then the woman I was just talking to, where are you? The woman, yep, she's, she's skedaddled. The snake! <laughs> um, anyhow, um, barred owls. Barred owls have black eyes. Owls with black eyes tend to be more nocturnal. That means they're best adapted to hunt when it's dark. Owls with lemon yellow eyes are more diurnal. They're best adapted to hunt during the day. Like a snowy owl, a great gray owl, a hawk owl, a short-eared owl, a burrowing owl. Owls with dull yellow to orange eyes, like Morley, are more halfway between night and day is sunrise, sunset, dawn, and dusk. These guys are more what we call crepuscular. Now, it doesn't mean that if, if Winnie's hunting in the middle of the day, she's not going to burst in the flame. She's not a, a, a vampire. It just means she's best adapted. Her eyes are built to collect more light. Now, we want to try something here. I've been flapping, I've been trying to fly for a long time, guys. Today might be my day. I've lost my house. Okay, before I flap, what is, what is the fastest animal on the planet other than us on a rocket ship? Awesome. Cheetah's fastest land mammals, 60, 70 miles per hour. There's a bird that goes a lot faster. Peregrine falcon. Peregrine falcon. You know how fast a peregrine has flown? 120 miles an hour or something like that? They've clocked them at 242 oh. miles per hour. 242! It's faster than some of you drive. <laughs> I've seen you. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. Okay. 
Do me a favor, don't shake at the bar for a minute, okay? We're gonna flap. I know, I'm sorry. I'm messing with you. Okay, ladies over there, guys over there, I'm gonna flap. Tell me if you can hear this. Here's a falcon feather. When it flaps, here's what you hear. Can you hear it? Yeah. Can mm -hmm. you hear it? Yep. Okay, here's my owl feather, same size. Can you hear oh, it? Oh, no. Can you hear it? No. You can shake again. Thank you. You're the best. Love you. Have kisses. <laughs> so, owl feathers, super, super soft. They make for a silent flyer. The negative is they don't have a lot of push. They're not a very fast flyer. Falcon, their feathers are very sturdy. They make a lot of noise. Falcon says, I don't care if you hear me or not. I'm just going to outfly you. Titus, <laughs> do me a favor, stick your hand up. And you too, mister, do you this. Mean? Titus, go like this. Okay. I'm going to touch oh. your hand with both. You tell me which one pushes on your hand harder, okay? All right, so hand like that. This one or that one? Which one pushed harder? Okay, I'm going to tickle you. You want to try it too, mister? <laughs> okay, so which one? And stick your arm out so I can. So which one pushes on you harder? This one or that one? And that one just broke. Yeah, <laughs> falcon feathers are much more rigid. They have a lot more. They, they have a lot more push when they flap their wings, but they and they make a lot more noise. But the falcon says, "Big deal." So you hear me or not? If I'm going 242 miles per hour, you're probably not going to outfly me unless you're in a jet plane. <laughs> All right, so I want to talk about three more things that we're going to do. Winnie, then we're going to shift over to the hawk. Um, people wonder how good are their senses. Morley's hearing is so good. Um, see the young ladies at the bar? Uh, who are working behind the bar? Morley can be listening to their heart beating right now. Wow. Morley can pinpoint the exact location of a mouse just by hearing it as it rustles through the grass a quarter of a mile away. Wow. That sounds impressive, right? I haven't got to the impressive part yet. Under two feet of snow. Quarter of a mile away, under two feet of snow, it can hear a mouse and it knows exactly where it is. That is crazy hearing. People say, well, wait a minute. I'm just sitting here talking to you. I got a big mouth and I'm not talking to this. Why is it morally and, and Winnie saying, stop it, you're hurting our ears? Um. Oh. You, sir, you look like you're a cool and happening dude. Um, you went to at least one concert in your life, right? Yes. Okay, pick your favorite artist that you went to see. Rush. Okay. Who was it, Rush? Good choice. Rush is known to be pretty loud when they play, right? Did you walk past the speakers when they were playing? A few times. And it was like, Whoa. what did you do to protect your ears? Not much. Not much? You didn't do anything? He, he doesn't listen to you at home, does he? <laughs> you didn't cover him up at all? No. Oh, okay, you, you're a diehard, man. Most people cover their ears, right? Owls have a flap of tissue in front of their ear that opens and closes their ear. That opens and closes their ear. It's called the opercular flap. So if it gets too loud, he can close his ears down a little. And hold it, Titus, I gotta look at you for a minute. Hold on. What? Your ears are right there. Huh. You know, if you were an owl, and what's your name? Wyatt. Wyatt? Wyatt, let me look at you. Your ears are like right there. Why isn't one up here and one down here? Would that look kind of funny? It would look funny unless you were an owl. Owl, one ear is up here, the other one's down here. They're offset. They're, they're offset, they're asymmetric. The reason for that is, let's go to dog to the Keely the dog. If you if you were playing with Keely the dog and you went like this, you went. Keely would turn his head one way, turn her head the other to figure out where the sound's coming from. We say that they're triangulating. Well, if your ears are offset, you're always triangulating. That's why owls have ears like that. Now. So that's their hearing. By the way, years ago, Maloney Airport got a hold of me. They said, hey, Mark, can you help us out? I said, sure, what's going on? 
Well, I'm a licensed bander for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. In my lifetime, I've caught and banded over 6,000 wild birds of prey. And they said, we have this snowy owl at the airport. It's almost gotten hit by a plane a few times. We're worried about the snowy getting hurt and killed. We're worried about Miracle on the Hudson people getting hurt and killed. Can you help us? And I said, of course we're not going to see a snowy owl get hurt on our watch. So I got over there, and here's this snowy about the size of Morley. Why don't you take that? You want that? No? There's a snowy owl about the same size as Morley. Now, the way I was planning on catching the owl, I have a cage. Picture this, the bull perch that Morley sits on is a cage. In the cage, I put a pigeon. Now, before you panic, I'm not offering the poor pigeon up to the owl gods. I love my pigeons. I give them all the same name. I call him Walter after the actor Walter Pigeon. Um, and the cage itself is weighted so the owl can't pick it up. And on top of all kinds of slip knot fishing line nooses. So the bird will get a talon caught in the noose, and then in essence they're anchored to the ground and then we run over and grab them. Well, I've banned it. I've caught thousands of birds that way. Problem is the snowy owl is a different type of beast. Where morally, you want to show off your feet for me? Morley's got these beautiful toes. You want to step up? See how Morley's got those big feet with the... Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know. I made you upset, didn't I? But you can see he's got those big toes, and you can see each individual toe. Snowy owl, the bristles are so long and they're so dense. Their toes look like Labrador... Their feet look like Labrador paws. You can't see the toes. You can see the claws coming out, but not the toes. Because of that, the owl... Hey, Morley. The owl kept slipping the nooses, and you could see the owl was figuring it out. So I said to my buddy, I said, we got to do something different. We're going to lose this bird. And he said, well, what? You didn't bring another trap. And I said, let me think about it. So here's, here's what I decided to do. We had watched the owl. We knew it went from perch one to perch two to perch three. We knew where it was going to go next unless something caused it to deviate from its plan. You know, it caught food or something, chased it. <clears throat> so we went to the next perch, we're out of sight of the owl, we dug a hole in the snow, I laid down, my buddy buried me, I'm 100% covered, he put Walter, my pigeon, on my chest, and then he left. He's off in the distance watching in his vehicle, and when the owl showed up, he beat the horn, beep, beep, so I knew the owl was there. When I knew the owl was there, I got, I got Walter moving around. My plan was when the owl came down to grab Walter, I was going to come out of the snow like the Terminator and grab the snowy owl. I thought it was a genius plan. I thought it was a genius plan. Did I tell you it was negative 26 degrees that day and I was under the snow for over an hour? It ceased to be genius about two minutes in. <laughs> Finally, I was so cold, I was so numb, I thought, boy, if I, if, if the owl comes now, I'm going to get shredded. I'm so numb, I can't feel my own body. So I managed to pull myself up. And right beside me is the light tower for the airport. And sitting on a light tower, staring down at me, was the owl. And I got to my buddy's nice warm vehicle, and he goes, he knew you were there the whole time. All right, how? I'm 100% covered. It didn't seem to get buried. It doesn't have x-ray vision. And I'm not under the snow going, la, 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 la. <laughs> So how did it know I was under there? Your heart. Heard my heart beating. That's what else it heard. Shivering. Shivering. <laughs> Shivering. <laughs> 26 and heard me breathing. That is incredible hearing. That is incredible hearing. So that's their hearing. By the way, you can see, like, especially with Winnie over there, you see she's got that facial disc. How are you doing? You got that look. Hold on a minute. You got that look. Are you going to fly? You don't want to fly. You see how I always have that facial disc? Mm -hmm. What that facial disc does, it kind of acts like your outer ear. It funnels the sound. In. And mm -hmm. what's interesting, you know how if you can't quite hear, you cut your ear to hear better? Owl's facial discs will change shape with size, you know, when they're listening to things. Jen, you want that? Winnie? Okay, come on. Just remember, give more than a wide berth, okay? Yeah. Do you want me to pick them up again and put them on your hand? Okay.
Good luck. Oh. Hey, I'm on his board. Generous <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thanks a lot. I love it when he does that. Um, Jenna's about ready. She's going to grab Winnie and she's going to bring Winnie around so you can get a more up close and personal view of Winnie. Yeah, just get her. The quicker you get her away from the perch, the better. Because she sees her perch, she wants to go back to it. Um, Winnie over here is a barred owl, which is the ones you tend to hear around when you have on that the left ones that go. Or as birders would say, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? <laughs> but, but, and you can see when she comes close to you, you're going to notice that her left wing, the feathers stick out a little bit different. That was the wing that got injured when she got hit by a car. Yeah, so she can't. She goes through the motion, she flaps her wings, she acts like she can fly. Unfortunately, she's not physically capable of flying anymore, which is why I have her. And we need to live to be, again, she's turning five this year. Our owls can make it to 10 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old. So potentially, she can make it to 30. Although, generally the ones that get run over by cars don't last as long. I don't understand why. Yeah. Um, so we talked about their hearing. We talked a little bit about their eyesight. They can see into the UV spectrum. Picture this. A golden eagle can spot a rabbit in the brush, barely moving, a mile away. That is crazy vision. That is crazy. And if you watch a falcon when they fly, they don't fly straight at their prey, they kind of spiral in at it. They kind of spiral in at it, you bored Morley? <laughs> um, because with falcons, their best vision for long distance is at a 45 degree angle. And then close, they're like they're wearing bifocals. And then when they get close, then they look straight on. But long distance, they go at a 45 degree angle. Which is why falcons don't fly straight at their prey, they kind of spiral at it. Yeah. How you doing, Molly? You bored? All right, so, here you go. So, picture this. During the day, the hawks, the eagles, the owls, the falcons, they can see approximately six times better than we can. At night time, the hawks, the eagles, the falcons, their vision is worse than ours. I've done hundreds of rescues at night time, and my favorite story to tell, I used to work at Yellowstone, and when I was at Yellowstone, we got a telephone call. And they said, hey guys, there's a bald eagle over here near Gardner. It, it got its foot stuck in a leg hole track just outside the park, and it's beating itself up and it needs help. We said, all right, we're on it. So we jumped in the car, we got over there. By the time we got there, it's black. The bald eagle managed to pull its leg out of the trap, but now it's exhausted, its leg is all shredded, it's got chunks of ice the size of my fist in its wings, and it's sitting on a seat of fence post about this high off the ground. Well, we're young guys. We didn't think about this. We just jumped in the car. When we got over there, we're like, okay, how are we going to grab this bird? We didn't bring a net, we didn't bring anything. All we had was a flashlight. So here's how we did it. My buddy operated the flashlight and he counted out loud. The light is off and he's like, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one. On five, you turn on the light for a second. Then you turn off, start all over again. When the light was on, I'd look where to put my feet. When the light was off, I moved until I was from Morley to me from a bald eagle that was three times the size of Morley. Because a big bald eagle weighs 15 pounds, a big one. Morley well, weighs five. Wow. So I'm like, the light is on, I'm standing next to the eagle, the eagle's staring at me, and if the eagle's looking at me like, you are going to die. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> but before the eagle pounced, the light went off. Thankfully, the eagle could have pounced, but it didn't. The eagle doesn't know, is the light coming on again? When is it coming on? How long is it going to be on for? If it's coming on at all? It doesn't understand English, and thank goodness it didn't know how to count. <laughs> and I'm waiting. My buddy's counting. I know when the light's coming on again. So as he's getting ready to turn on the light, I'm reaching closer and closer and closer. 
And I'm already moving my hands, so when the light comes on, I'm already three quarters of the way there, and I grabbed the eagle. It took two of us to subdue it. We got it home. We had to, we had to anesthetize it. We had to x-ray it. Um, what we found was the poor bird, nothing was broken, thank goodness. Its leg was torn up. We had to do some stitch work. We got it on antibiotics for several months, but then finally we were able to let it go, thank goodness. Um, you'd be crazy to do that with an owl. You're sneaking up on an owl, or you bump into a tree and say, excuse me, sir, and the owl's watching you, shaking their head, going, humans are so silly. <laughs> because their vision is so much better than ours. Right. Um, plus, owls can hunt completely in the dark. They can hunt all by hearing. There was a gentleman at Cornell University, I forgot his name, I think it was Dr. Payne, if I remember right. He did this <coughs> groundbreaking study. He had barn owls. He put a barn owl in a pitch black room. He covered the floor with leaves. He had microphones, lights, and cameras. And he had it set up that the floor is covered with leaves. He had barn owls sitting on a perch. And by remote control, they would open up and let a mouse go. Now the mouse is running around on the leaves. <laughs> Every time they heard the barn owls slam to the ground, they would turn on the lights and look with the camera. Every time the barn owl was sitting on the mouse. And they said, holy cow, they're doing this with no light at all. This has got to be all by hearing. Well, somebody who was real, you know, covered all bases said, well, maybe it's, it's infrared. And it makes sense. So they took, they, and this is before they had infrared cameras, they took a piece of newspaper, crumpled it up, tied a string to it. That newspaper's not giving off an infrared signature. They would toss it out and drag it. The owl still pounced on it. So it was doing it all by hearing. That is crazy. Their hmm. hearing is amazing. All right, so, um, we got their vision. We got their hearing. Last one, their sense of smell. What do you think, good or bad? Good. Pretty good? Yeah, very good. Mom, <laughs> I'm looking at you. You've probably heard this, or you've probably said this. Don't touch, and if not, you're going to probably say it soon. Don't touch a baby bird, because mom will desert it. Have you ever heard that story? Because why? Because of the smell, right? That's a little white thing. Most birds have a lousy sense of smell. Now, there are some exceptions to the rules. Turkey vultures can smell fresh dead things from miles away. If you go down to the Amazon rainforest, you got black vulture, turkey vulture, king vulture. Black vulture can find the dead sloth on the, on the jungle floor by smelling it. There's 300 feet of canopy between the sloth and the vultures. The turkey vulture can smell it, but the black vulture and the king vulture can't. Some of those leaves are as big as me. How are the turkey vulture, how's the king vulture and the black vulture gonna find the sloth? Last time I knew, dead things don't make a lot of noise. <laughs> Anybody have an idea? Mm, no. You follow the turkey vulture. I'm uh, following you, cowboy. <laughs> if that turkey vulture can find it, it's a beautiful symbiotic relationship. The turkey vulture, let's say it is a dead slot. This turkey vulture is not strong enough to rip it open to start eating. Black vultures shows up. I think black vultures are just reloads. They're not strong enough. They're not bringing anything to the party other than they're increasing numbers, and maybe that helps. The king vulture is strong enough to rip it open, and it eats, but it leaves a finer seed for the turkey vulture. So it's a beautiful symbiotic relationship. Um, so I got one last story to tell you, then we're gonna then we're gonna shift over and we're gonna look at my hawk. Years ago. Potsdam. Potsdam's like an hour, what, hour, maybe an hour um, northwest of here. And did my undergrad at Potsdam State, went off to the University of Wisconsin, worked out a master's in education and wildlife, um, wildlife management. Came back to Potsdam, got a second master's in education. And I'm looking at my folks' house and see what we have my folks. One day I decided I want to see what kind of animals I can see. So just Thanks, guys. Hey, Mark. So just as the sun is breaking the horizon, I'm at least a quarter to a third of a mile out in the field, walking around, see what I can find. And this kind of popped up. At that point, I had already worked on a bighorn sheep study. 
I worked on a wolf moose study. Heck, I'd actually tackled a live wild bear by then. People say, whoa, it's not as impressive as it sounds. Mama was tranquilized, it was a yearling. I had to keep it with Mama. It's still dragged me across the forest floor. A bear is still a bear, I don't care how young it is. Um, anyhow, I work with skunk. They're cool, inquisitive little animals. But if they know you're human, they tend to leave you alone. So when the skunk popped up, I'm yelling at it and waving my arms. I'm like, hey, scrap me to get out of here. 999,999 times out of a million, they'll quietly turn and walk away. They don't want to have anything to do with us. This was the one in the million. It started coming after me. <laughs> the newspaper articles at the time were saying, hey, don't go near the skunks. The rabies epidemic is super, super high this year. I don't know if it was rapid or not. I don't want to find out. So I turned around and I'm running through the field. I'm zigzagging back and forth. I'm waving my arms in the air. I'm yelling at the top of my lungs, hoping to persuade the skunk to leave me alone. I look over my shoulder. The skunk is following me like a in the pew. <laughs> Not only is it following me, there's tall grass, there's rocks, there's holes, there's ruts. I kept stumbling. It's catching me. And I'm thinking, oh man. Oh man, what do I do? How are we doing? How are we doing? Kind of tip him over. Yeah, I, I, I got you. I got you. <laughs> Yeah, And you know, once she sees her perch, she's going to want to fly. So if you get over, take your hand off and just move toward quick. Well, she's like, I've, I've done enough flying. <laughs> um, so I'm running, I'm looking behind me. The skunk is following me like Pepe Le Pew. And I'm thinking, man, what do I do? What do I do? Well, this is how my brain works. As I'm running from a potentially rabid skunk, I don't know if it's rabid or not, I don't want to find out. So as I'm running, I'm thinking to myself, the main predator of the skunk is the great horned owl. And great horned owls do what? I used to go out and I would hoot to the owls. I got pretty good for a while. I'm a young guy, I used to hoot to the owls. I could get the owls scooting back. I could get them flying in. So I go down to the local establishments, tell all the young ladies, hey, I'm the owl whisperer, I can dog out <laughs> until one day my dog got barking, got the owls hooting, and I realized you don't have to be that good at me, tell them that's where it made me sound like a lunatic. So I stopped telling them that. So I'm thinking, if I could fool an owl, I should be able to fool a skunk. By now, because I can't get going because of all the rocks and the holes and the ruts, I'm huffing and puffing. I can hear the raspy breath of the skunk behind me. I can hear his footfalls in the grass. It's closing in. And I thought, man, it's now or never. So I took a deep breath and I swung around and I was probably to me to tight us away from the skunk. And I hooted like an owl. And the skunk literally stopped. And it looked back and forth, back and forth. I did it a second time. Skunk lay flat on its belly. And I left. I didn't hang around to find out what would happen next. But, ladies, you know this about the Y chromosomes in your life? Gentlemen, you know this about yourselves, and you're backing me on this. When my heart rate slowed down, I said, that was awesome. Awesome. Right? Uh -huh. This is why ladies, you have about a dozen, two dozen, I should be dead stories. <laughs> Gentlemen, you have hundreds. <laughs> I have thousands. And I said, man, that was incredible. I got to tell somebody. I found my old ornithology professor, Potsdam State, Dr. Solanka told him the story and he got all excited and he goes, great, typical male, great, I know where this family is from, I'm going to go try this tonight. Oh said, if you this is not on me, I've already graduated. <laughs> the next day I had to know. My dad was a professor at the college, I bummed it right with my dad, got to campus, got over to Dr. Swanka's door. By that time his door was always open, it was shut. And I'm like, oh man. And I almost left, but I thought I'd better. So I sheepishly knock on the door, and I heard this muffled, enter! And I swear it was like open the crypt. The door's like, and as I'm opening up the door, I'm grateful not to be hit by a waft of skunk. <laughs> and he's sitting at his desk, and I looked at him, I said, well, did you try it? He got a little twinkle in his eye, a little smirk on his face, and he said, it works. Well, I published that story decades ago. 
I've told that story face to face to over a hundred plus a thousand people. Probably, I don't know, let's see, the number's building. Um, I've had over 300 people try it. All males, by the way, work every time. Because owls, they can hunt when it's so dark that the poor skunk can't see them. If it's so dark that the owl can't see, it can hunt by hearing alone. They hunt when it's so dark, or, um, you know, they, they, they can hear so well that they don't even need the light. And I didn't tell you this, Morley's gripping power, an average person gripping power, they say, is about 50 pounds per square inch. Hmm. Morley's is 500 pounds per square inch. Wow. I was banding at a great horned owl nest one year, and we found a cat skull. And you can see the talon marks where it punctured right through the skull. It would be like if you had a grip of an owl, you'd walk over and say, hey, I want that coconut, and reach over in all five digits going into the coconut. Wow. That is crazy strong. And I've caught birds that have had that yellowish tinge and reek of skunk. They can't smell it. They're like, is that all you got? And finally, <coughs> I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Wyatt. Wyatt. Uh, Wyatt. I am sorry, Wyatt. <coughs> Wyatt, have you ever gone, do you like swimming? Yes. Do you wear goggles when you swim? No. Do, have you seen people wear goggles? No. Okay. Guys, where do people, why do people wear goggles when they swim? So they can see better underwater. See better underwater and? And it protects your eye, right? Mm -hmm. Owls have their version of a goggle. They have an upper lower eyelid like you and I do, but they have a third eyelid that comes down. It's clear. It's called the nictitating membrane. When it comes down, they can see through it like a pair of goggles, but it protects their eyes just like owls. All right, got one last bird to look at. This is Mortimer. Let me make snorty. Mortimer. All right, now. The falcon. The reason, no, I want to tell you about the hood first. Mortimer the hog. Remember the old Seinfeld episodes? The Seinfeld was all, what? Well, it, was, it was a show about nothing, right? Yeah. Well, here's my, my hood story that's all about the hood, but not about the hood. So it's kind of like a Seinfeld episode. <laughs> I live up near the St. Lawrence River. This woman called me up one day and she goes, hey, can you help me out? I said, sure, what's going on? She said, we have this peacock that showed up at our house. Winter's coming, we don't know where the peacock came from, and we're worried about him, and they gave him a name. We're worried about Sam. And I'm thinking, peacock? The woman doesn't have a peacock, she's got a pheasant. So without thinking about it, I said, yeah, I can help you. Because I've been hurt before. I've had DEC agents call me and say, hey, we have this baby eagle we need help with. I get over there and there's a black back gull. So I've learned, until I know the person, I don't trust their identification skills. You all seem like nice people, mm -hmm. but I don't trust you. <laughs> okay. So, I figured she got a pheasant. Well, I got over there. The problem is the woman was a librarian. Librarians know everything. She had a peacock. Not only did she have a peacock, I promised to help her catch it. I never caught a peacock in my life. <laughs> I ran over with a big butterfly net. You know peacocks can fly really well? I know. And that day I heard what peacock laughter sounded like. It kind of sounded like because it flew over my head. I tried everything. My frail male ego took a beating that day. I was like, man, finally I said, all right, I gotta go home and think about this. Now they had eight or nine piles of seats. I said, let's just consolidate down to this pile right here. Then I went home and I thought about it. A week went by. Two weeks went by. See Sam walking around the trap. I knew he would. But here's the thing I didn't realize he was going to do. All of a sudden in my hands, I feel the string. I feel tug, tug, tug. He's tugging on the string. He's not only tugging on the string, he's following the string. Pretty soon I can't see him anymore, but I can hear him coming around the corner of the building. So I thought, if I don't move, he won't see me. There's a pure white wall here, pure white wall there. Sam's head snakes around the corner, and I swear, he winked at me. And he did that multiple times. 
finally, finally just put me in my place, and I finally said, all right, I can't deal with this right now. So I went home, I tied the trap so it couldn't be sprung, tied, left the string, left everything. Came back, came back, well, a week later she called me up and she goes, oh, Sam doesn't care about the trap anymore. I said, perfect, I'm there tomorrow. Next day I'm in position, Sam shows up, first thing he does, tug, 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 he's tugging on the string. He follows the string again. He comes around the corner, he winks at me again. <laughs> I'm like, how's he doing this? And I know what he's doing, he's put me in my place. He's saying, silly you think you're so smart. Well, he's finally done. So now, we, now that he put me in my place, he's going to go have a big thing there. So he's over, he's at the pile of seats, I'm ready to pull the trap, but he's got to put his head down. If not, I'm going to have a concussed Sam. <laughs> so i got to wait. Finally, he lowers his head. When he did, I pulled the string, the neck goes, chunk over the top. I'm about ready to celebrate, but much to my chagrin, what I forgot was this. Birds of prey, all their power is in their grip. Sam's power is in his legs. He's pushing back, the threads are ripping, Sam's getting loose, I gotta get going. So I'm like, ah! So I start running. I go barely around the corner of the building. My hat, my hat goes flying off my head. As I'm barely around the corner of the building, wood chips were flying that day, guys. I'm getting closer. Sam's back is free. I'm getting closer. His shoulders are free. I'm getting closer. His neck is free. I'm from me to you, Texas. I go for him. I'm flying through the air, I'm doing a Superman, I'm screaming, no! Just as Sam's head came out of the net, and Sam's 100% free, I come crashing to earth, I have a mouthful of wood chips, I have Sam in my arms, it's like wrestling a feathered pterodactyl, I'm spitting out wood chips, and Sam's like, Aah! I'm hanging on for dear life, and the people come running, and they say, what are you doing, what are you doing, Sam? And I shrieked, grab my hat! And I, they both looked at each other like, this guy's conceited. I'm like, grab my hat! Meanwhile, Sam is like, ah! So they brought my hat to me. I shift Sam to my left arm. I take the hat, I put it over his head. As soon as his head was covered, he relaxed. That's what the hood does. It's my long-winded version. I love that story, though. All right, so we're going to get Mortimer over here so can say hi to you. Now, unfortunately, what keeps Mortimer happy is food. So I'm going to have to feed him. Problem is, Mortimer doesn't eat snickerdoodles. <laughs> he eats mice, things like that. Unfortunately, he also eats stale chicks, which is what I got. Is that going to traumatize him? No. <laughs> is it going to traumatize anyone else? <laughs> no. Okay. All right, so let me, let me get Mortimer's hood off. Hey, Morty. Come on, buddy. I know. It comes off pretty easy. Alright, so here's Mortimer. By the way, Mortimer's a Harris Hawk. Harris Hawks are found in like Texas, right across to California. They used to come as far north as into Colorado. Oh, you saw that, didn't you? Into Colorado and Wyoming. But these guys are calling the wolves of the sky. They hunt in groups. Five, ten, even twenty. They have an alpha male, alpha female. And what happens is they'll hang out together on utility poles, because out west, utility pole is the best purchase. But if you have 20 birds, and one bird here is touching a power line, and 20 birds over is touching a power line, they all just got electrocuted. So we lost them in Colorado. We lost them in Wyoming. They're just, well, they're just barely in the, south, the southwestern part of the country. Um, if you really want to see Harris is um, a lot, you would go more toward Mexico, the grasslands in South America, Patagonia, that place. Um, and again, the females are bigger. More, yeah, he, you saw the food, didn't you? Mortimer's a male, a female's twice his size. I used to fly, he only weighs about a pound and a quarter. I used to fly a big female named Frida, and she weighed two and a half pounds. At two and a half pounds, she caught on her own, a 25 pound tom turkey. Wow. She attacked a gander goose. If she knew the head was on the end of that long neck, she would have caught a gander goose. She attacked my 35 pound, very bewildered, very confused bird dog, who after that, he didn't know if he should point to duck for cover. Physically, he wasn't injured, but emotionally, he was 
scarred for life. <laughs> she body slammed and chased out of the woods a white-tailed deer. She even body slammed me in the face three or four times and father one day reached up and grabbed my lip. Not really a body piercing kind of guy. So when she did that, I kind of manhandled her and I said, listen, you're not the alpha, I'm the alpha. After that, she left me alone. Now you can see, he turned his back on you and he's got his wings out. Mm -hmm. What he's doing, we call this, this, this behavior, they call it mantling, because birds of prey make themselves, you know, they, they expend energy, they make themselves vulnerable to attack or injury catching food. So they don't want some Johnny come lately to come and steal their food. So what he's doing is protecting his food because he heard about you, Titus. He knows that you're going to eat his food. Would you? Yeah, you don't. You wouldn't, but he doesn't know that. Yeah. So he's he's covering his food. Um, I was actually driving through here in Saranac Lake uh, two years ago, and as I was just passing Lake Colby on the right, the hospital on the left, I'm driving and I'm watching this this amazing action taking place over the road. There was an osprey zigzagging back and forth carrying a fish. There was another bald eagle chasing it, zigzagging back and forth after it. There was a second bald eagle flying in an intercept, you know, straight at it, not zigzagging, so it was catching up really quick. And when the eagle finally got close enough to the ball, to the osprey, the osprey abandoned the fish, it dropped it. Both eagles immediately went down to grab it. I don't know if they ever got it or not because I had to pay attention to the road. Uh, yeah. Hey, no. <laughs> Keeping you safe. <laughs> uh, and he just finished eating. He's completely done. He ate that whole thing. When he does, can I, get, can I pick you back up for you? Come on back up. If you take, I right, lift both feet. Okay. I don't know if you noticed, but right here, there's a bump in his neck. That bump in his neck is the day old chick he just ate. Oh. Hawks, eagles, falcons have a crop. It's a storage tank in the neck. Mm -hmm. Owls don't. So that affects their behavior. Where a hawk will be on the ground and it'll stuff itself like crazy, owls have amazing lifting ability. They can actually carry the food up with them and carry it elsewhere. Owls will do a lot of food caching. Well, they'll carry their food up and stick it. I always kind of like them too. Hawks are kind of like lions on the Serengeti where they gorge themselves right then and there. Owls are more like leopards on the Serengeti where they carry their food up into the tree where nobody else can get it. And then they can eat at their leisure. Yeah. Uh, let me... Yeah. All right. And I keep his hood on him. People wonder, does his hood... Do I have his hood on him all the time? He only wears the hood when I'm at situations like this. At home, each bird has a chamber. Show off. Each bird has a chamber that's like 10 foot by 22 foot by 9 foot. And they have, you know, screening area where they can get fresh air and sunlight. They got water baths. They got different perches. But when I travel with them, I don't want him eating himself up. So when I travel with them, I put his hood back on him. Okay, can I put your hood back on, babes? Alright, hood. Was he rescued or? Um, give me just a second. Okay, um, good question. Out of the three birds here, Winnie was rescued. She was a rescue bird. The other two were both hatched in captivity. Certain people have permits for breeding and selling birds of prey. I have to have permits to have them. They're on my educational permit. Um, again, I for the last 14, 15 years, I was teaching courses at Paul Smith on Birds of Prey. Plus, plus I have my own business we do. So they're ambassadors. Yeah, but they came from captivity. Um, now, I've got some last minute things to tell you in closing that we do. I always tell people, if, if you're interested, I'm going to kind of go around the, around the calendar. Um, January, February, March, um, I'm usually getting phone calls from local airports or um, large factory farms 
about removing snowy owls from places where they can get hurt and killed. Plus, we're part of the Snowy Owl Project Snowstorm. Yes. Um, so we catch them, we take, we get some feathers to test for things like heavy metals, pesticides. We figure out the males and females, how old they are, how well they're doing. Put a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service band on them, get them to a safe area and release them. Um, all year we're doing rescues. In about this time, right now we're working with goshawks. Goshawks were just listed as endangered in, in Pennsylvania. Hmm. And to the best of our knowledge, the only solid population of goshawks in the Northeast that we know of right now is the Adirondacks. Hmm. But we don't know that for sure. So the state is sending up a, they're just putting a proposal together to figure out numbers. And my friend who works for the state, who's writing the proposal, got a hold of me and she said, hey, Mark, we're going to start looking for, you know, figure out the number of goshawks in the state. And I said, well, that's good. It's about time. We need to know. And she said, we can't hire anybody new, so we're going to contract out. And saying, you're already doing it. We're going to hopefully, hopefully maybe we can contract to you and you can get paid for something you do anyhow. And I thought, huh, get paid to do what I already do for free. Huh. Not a lot So, but we look for goshawks this time of year. We see tabs on them. Goshawks are having issues with temperatures changing and things like uh, West Nile virus. We've had birds that have died from West Nile virus. I've also removed ticks from from goshawks because they nest in the woods and ticks actually get on birds. Um, and and so we're keeping tabs on our population in the. Mid-June through the end, end of July into August, we work with kestrels. Kestrels are the smallest falcons in North America. We used to call them sparrowhawks. I got 150 boxes north of us here. We ban the kestrels every year. We invite people to come out. If you want to hold a baby falcon in your hand, or if you have a little one that you want them to hold the baby falcon, my baby, my kestrels that I banded as babies, have shown up as far as south as south of Miami. If they go any further south, they're in Cuba or the Gulf of Mexico. We invite people to come participate. In the fall, you know those tiny little owls, the soft white owls? They sound like this, they go doot, doot, doot. A few years ago, they had the owl they call Rockefeller that showed up at the Rockefeller Center tree. That was the soft white owl. We catch and we ban them. Because if we're not keeping tabs on our population, we don't know how it's doing. Uh, we almost lost the peregrine falcon because we didn't know. And then when we finally started looking at numbers, we're like, wait a minute. Peregrine falcons are disappearing like crazy. Same with bald eagles. It was a time we didn't have bald eagles in the, in the park. We had one nesting pair in the entire state. And it didn't even produce any chicks that year. Now, this last year, they claim we had over 500 nesting pairs. So, yeah, so we need to cool. keep tabs on them. Um, we invite people to participate. So, if you want to come hold a baby, a baby kestrel in your hand or a little salt wet, we're always working with them. Now, people say, "How can we do that? How do we?" Do? Well, my business at Ronnie Crackers. I'm all over the web. You can look us up. I also write children's books, and I brought my children's books. And on the back of my children's book is my contact information. So even if you don't want to get a book, but you want to contact us first, take a picture of that and you got my contact information. Okay? Um, a few years ago, I started writing children's books for kids, what, 7 through 12? Um, I, uh, I, well, I used to teach high school, so I thought this is a good way to you know, get my stories out there, educate people and make it kind of fun for kids. So I have five books out. I got another two that are written. One is just waiting for illustrations. The other one is in the editing process. My plan right now is 22 stories because they're all adventures I've had. First one, the great snowy owl papers about being buried in the snow, trying to get snowy owl. With a huge twist because it was my story being buried in the, under the snow, but a buddy of mine did it out in Wisconsin. And when he did it, they, um, they saw him bury him at the Greasy Spoon next to the airport. So when his buddy went to get him coffee at the Greasy Spoon, they thought he killed him, so they jumped him. 
And so, but then I super sanitize it for kids. So, when, so they're squirting them in the face with a super soaker and beating them over the head with a mop and a broom. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I got, you're welcome to check out this, the books. You're welcome to come get some up close with the owls. And with Mortimer, just don't reach up and try and pet them. Unless you're, in, I always tell people, unless you're in a body piercing, so don't care where you get pierced. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, anybody have any last minute questions? Okay. Well, thank you for having us. <laughs> <laughs> well, it absorbs light, it, its eyes does, so... Hi! Hi, Winnie! Beautiful! Absolutely beautiful! That is a menacing look.